Thank you so much, and thank you all for coming back from coffee break in an expedient manner. Um, so this this session is called the lightning round, and I, um, I, I agree that this is the lightning round for mineralization storage. So I kept the title. Um, you heard a little bit from my colleague Tog Chaif yesterday on a couple, of, a couple of panels about team science, and we've heard it echoed a little bit here and there. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the opportunity that we have as a research community, not just as researchers. So we had the conversation earlier about scientists and policy people and, uh, and being on the stage at the same time. Um, we are all team science. Everybody who's in this room, even if you, you are not a scientist, you didn't take a science discipline uh, in, in university, this is a conversation that really, when you, you're talking to people in, whether they're policymakers or they're community members or they're financers or, or insurance underwriters, the common language that we have to talk about what we're doing in the subsurface and the way that we're generating trust is through that science, whether we're communicating it effectively, whether we've done the research effectively and, and can um, back it up with peer-reviewed literature, and uh, whether all of those pieces really fit together. And that's, that's what I want to talk about today. Um, it is so exciting to me to see all of you here to see, we're going to get to go see Mammoth, uh, which last year when we were here, if you were if you went on the tour, it was sort of the arm wave, like, and Mammoth's going to be over there someplace, and, and here we are a year later, and it's actually going to be there. We get to go see it, um, and we're we've gone from a couple of little projects. We had the Wallula project in Washington State, and uh, and the the Carb Fix project, the initial project here in Iceland. And for a long time, it was just those two little projects. And now we're seeing projects that are developing uh, additional projects in Iceland. There is now funding to be able to do some characterization while drilling in, in the United States. We're seeing, we heard uh, projects in Kenya, uh, in um, South Africa, in India. So the, the idea of team science kind of um, we, we implemented it at PNNL with our staff because we had people who were coming out of their postdoc programs, um, you know, kind of coming in and saying, look, I'm the expert in this thing, which is great. That's how they train us as scientists, is you become the expert in the thing. But once you're the expert in the thing, now you have to go work with other experts in their things in order to do something that's, that's really meaningful. So bringing in early career researchers and, and kind of letting them know that it's okay, that they don't have all the answers, and that they need to go to the person in the office next to them, or the person across campus, or the person across the country or across the world, to, to do that collaborative research is not just okay, but that's virtuous. That's where we need to be. Um, and, and trying to instill in ourselves as well this virtuous cycle of, um, of collaboration Todd is a geochemist. I am a modeler by by temperament and by training. Uh, we're both geologists, uh, you know, on paper, but I think we come at the world from really different perspectives. And so, even in the early days when when we were working to try to get uh, try to get additional funding to analyze the the samples that we collected at Wallula and do some of the the work that's been published over the last few years, I think just trying to get those two domains to interact, trying to get the modelers and the geochemists in the same conversation, in the same room at the same time, um, in a way that was, that was mutually beneficial and to create that virtuous cycle of computational experiments informing laboratory experiment, experiments, informing the computational work, and eventually moving that out into the field. So um, there's, there's no shortage of interesting work to do. I think in science too, you sort of guard your little area of expertise. Um, there's no need for that. There's plenty of new areas of expertise. So as we have these, these early career people who are coming out of their programs, it's wonderful to be able to tell them there are so many questions that we haven't answered yet. Yes, we have these projects that are, that are being developed 
and there is this groundswell of interest and, and investment and subsidies and, and uh, government funding grants for, for um, projects, the voluntary market, compliance markets. I think we're, we heard a little bit about CBAM. I think we'll hear more about that as, as time moves on. Um, but as those things deploy, we continue to learn and we continue to find new questions to answer, including, and this is, this is the, the standard list that I usually show, it's evolved a little bit over time. Um, what we're, what we're really trying to do is create the toolkit, create the technologies that developers are going to use, that regulators are going to use, and that we're gonna to use to communicate with communities. So just showing you kind of how we, we put our money where our mouths are. Um, this is our team science at PNNL in the mineralization space, and it's actually bigger than this. We couldn't fit everybody on the slide in time because the team is growing rapidly. And this doesn't show all of the other, all of our collaborators at Columbia University, at IIT Bombay, uh, at South Africa Council for Geosciences, um, at CarbFix. So this, this community is, is growing. It's a really rich research area, and it is, um, a really cool collaborative community. We're trying to figure out how to support that community to make the work that we're doing with US Department of Energy funds uh, multiplicative in its value instead of just instead of just additive, although additive's good too. So um, our current R&D, we're, we're looking at how to model regional scale CO2 injection. I'll show you some modeling in a bit. Um, we're being asked for those tools to facilitate permitting to help um, support project development, to support conversations with communities about how this technology works and how it would work for them, um, to understand costs. Uh, that's, that's another big piece, and I'll show you in the modeling again, that's sort of a motivation for why we're doing that work. And then we're very focused right now on uh, getting to drill a well. I'm told that there is finally, money has finally moved to University of Wyoming and we will I'm, I'm told we can hope to be drilling in the spring, so we'll finally have a characterization well for basalts in, in the United States, uh, hopefully next year. So I'm not gonna talk through this. You've already heard a bunch of this, these two end member approaches of supercritical versus um, aqueous CO2 injection. There are, are pros and cons of each approach. Um, it just so happens that the two, the two projects that have been done where we have published data, um, the Wallula project where I live and the, uh, the, the CarbFix project here are these perfect end members of this set. Um, and understanding how those two work helps us understand how all the stuff in between works. So we want to create um, reactive transport modeling tools that are, that are benchmarked against each other um, and that are available publicly for people who want to do this work. So we're really starting from first principles. You would think that this is, you know, reservoir simulators are, are old hat, they exist, you can download them on GitHub, um, and there are very expensive gold-plated versions in industry, and yet when we, when we started just asking very simple questions of the simulators uh, regarding reactivity, it was clear that there's a lot that still needs to be done. So we've started with, this is without the reactivity, just looking at the aqueous and CO2 cases, or the aqueous and, and supercritical CO2 cases to understand whether we believe what the models are telling us. Um, here we're looking at mass fraction of CO2, where the plume is post-injection, right after injection ends, and uh, 100 years on, and looking at what that footprint is. And for the, the supercritical CO2, you'll see you know, at the end of injection, we're at 1,461 meters. All of this is, this is all kind of a, a toy problem. This is a sandbox that we did. We'll have a paper coming out shortly, and I'll talk in much more detail about this at GHGT. But just trying to get these tools to work so that we can put them out there and do some code comparisons with other, other tools that are available. And then what is the, uh, the change in pressure. What is the pressure excursion? That's a big one for modeling. 
but all of this work really relies on um, the, the modelers and the experimentalists working together to try to parameterize them. So taking this geochemistry, which is very cool. I'm not a geochemist. I have a, a deep and new appreciation for that as I've worked with Todd and his team over the years to try to understand how to, how to take information from that geochemistry and translate it into the modeling tools that we have which is not a simple, that's not a simple fix. It's not a simple research problem. There's a lot of work to be done there. And it's, it's work that we can't do our little team at PNNL on our own. So we're working to develop these tools, develop methodologies. Uh, we have a, a sampling and characterization protocol that we're getting ready to publish on how we do our reactivity characterization at PNNL so that people don't have to send us their sam samples. We love doing the evaluation but we're a research lab and we just, we can't handle the volume. So this is something that, uh, you know, the, the Vikram and his, Vikram uh, Vishal in IIT Bombay could use, his staff could use, the people at Columbia could use, um, CGS, people around the world, uh, to make sure that we have a consistent data set that we can base our models on. And then team science is incomplete without our communities, the host communities, the policymakers in those communities, and our next generation of scientists. So I will use my moment on the podium here to remind you all, if you are, if you are one of, the, I can't believe we are the old people now, I don't know how that happened, but as the old people in, in CCS, in mineralization storage, it's our, it's our privilege and our duty to mentor to bring in that next generation of scientists and get them excited, whether you're talking to first graders, which is a lot of fun, or you're talking to, uh, to postdocs, this is our opportunity to pass that information along at a moment that is very, very exciting for all of us. So with that, here's another picture of PNNL's team science part of it, and thank you very much for your time. <laughs>